These are the week 11 slides covering mitosis and cancer and more broadly the cell cycle. Uh, mitosis is the process of cellular division, cancer is uncontrolled division, and those are both related to kind of the lifespan of an individual cell, which we call the cell cycle. So now we're kind of moving away from the organ systems that we've been talking about over the past unit. Before that, we talked about the structure and function of cells. So in doing this, we're going to be thinking about how an organism grows throughout their life um, and also the different cells and tissues that exist within an organism um, and start thinking about kind of bigger scale processes and information flow. So just to start um, out by kind of introducing what mitosis actually is and revisiting that, just so you have a working definition, this is basically how cells make copies of themselves. So there's a lot of kind of uh, gendered terminology here. So like mother cells and daughter cells. Mother cell, it just means the original starting cell that then makes a copy of its DNA and divides into two daughter cells that are completely identical to the mother and to each other. And we distinguish this from a different cellular division process called meiosis, which remember happens at completely different times in an organism's life, produces different types of cells. Mitosis and meiosis are about as unrelated as you can get. So I know a lot of people tend to group them together in their heads, but we separate them out into different learning units for a reason because they are structurally very different. Um, but in mitosis, DNA is not changed in any way. We're also going to start practicing visualizing DNA and kind of uh, using different terminology for it and understanding parts of the units by which we kind of package and organize DNA. Before we get much farther, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about why we care about mitosis. Um, I think when we get into kind of the nitty gritty of cell biology, it's easy to get lost and just be like, why does this matter? It's so small but it has a huge impact on us. Um, whenever you get a cut, you rely on mitosis and stem cells to kind of fill that in and heal you, any wound healing. Um, so stem cells are one of the types of cells in our body that are able to still undergo mitosis. Um, some types of cells, uh, once they're already differentiated and adult and matured, can't undergo mitosis. But we have plenty of stem cells floating around our body, which are kind of like those Pokemon that can evolve into many different types of cells, they can still make copies of themselves and then differentiate and fill in tissue. Um, this is also how we go from being one tiny little cell to these huge, complex, crazy organisms that we are through mitosis. Um, so embryonic development and early human life depends on this process of mitosis. Unfortunately, um, mitosis that is unregulated also causes cancer. So life is this precarious balance between not having enough cell division and life and having too much cell division. And cancer is out of control cell division. So we're going to talk about that process. Um, Cancer is a topic that has probably touched most of you in some way. Uh, I know that when I took genetics, um, my grandfather was staying with us and I was taking care of him while he was dying of terminal cancer. And then later in cell biology, I wrote a paper about the type of cancer that he had. So um, it was for me kind of helpful to understand what was going on with him and why he was taken from me. Um, so I'm hopeful that in understanding the mechanism of cancer a little bit better, you have more awareness of what's happening inside your own body and the body of people you love. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to talk about Henrietta Lacks. Um, I am hopeful some, at least some of you may have heard of her because more and more people are hearing about this remarkable woman. Um, she's pictured in the image on the right on your screen. Um, and she was born in 1920, so quite some time ago. Um, she was a young mother of five people, um, and she had a type of cervical cancer. And this was back in the time when people didn't really know how to grow human cells in the lab, so we couldn't study them to make different medications and vaccines like we can today. Um, and so she went to Johns Hopkins uh, 
hospital. Um, they were one of the few hospitals at the time that treated people of color, but unfortunately it was still kind of in a separate ward with not many resources and not a lot of communication between patients and doctors. Um, so the doctor who was treating her uh, uh, thought like, hey, that's an interesting looking tumor. Maybe one of my friends will be curious about it and try to grow it. And he took a sample of it, a biopsy, without her knowledge, let alone her consent. Um, so it turns out that her cells grow amazingly well in the lab in a super regulated way where we can like understand how they're gonna grow. We can kind of predict it and study it and use it as a tool. But again, it was taken without her consent at a time when black people in this country did not have the same rights as white people. Um, it was taken from her by white doctors who then went on to become very, very wealthy as a result and gain a lot of power. Her family, meanwhile, didn't know anything was happening. Um, their mother was taken from, her, from them. She died from this cancer and uh, many of them didn't get a full education um, and they didn't have access to a lot of resources. So they themselves were sick from uh, illnesses that are treated by medications that were developed using Henrietta's cells. Um, so this is just a horrible, abominable situation. Um, later on, when they found out what had happened, they felt very violated. They were like, you know, is our mother a zombie? What's going on? Her cells are still alive. And basically, a doctor just gave them a genetics textbook and said, this will explain everything. If you gave me a genetics textbook, it wouldn't, I wouldn't know what the hell you were talking about, let alone these people who did not have access to education. So um, it they continued to be violated. They continued to just be completely disrespected by the biomedical field um, until kind of there was more awareness about what had happened to their mother. Um, now there's a whole Henrietta Lacks Foundation. Uh, there's a lot more laws in place to prevent the taking of tissue in that way. Um, and so many lives have been saved as a result of Henrietta, but it's still kind of like, you know, was it ultimately worth it to have violated someone so profoundly? Um, it's really a stain on biomedical research. Um, so I hope that you uh, can check out some of the links I've posted about Henrietta Lacks. Consider reading The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. There is a um, HBO movie uh, based on The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which is an amazing book, and I cannot recommend them enough. Pirate it if you have to, <laughs> just to watch it. So um, some things that I want you to keep in mind from previous weeks are ideas about the structure and function of cells. So specifically between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, and even more specifically in terms of whether they have a nucleus to store their DNA. Also, last week we talked about distinctions between mitosis and meiosis. So just kind of keep that in your mind as well, that even though they're both cell division, they're separate processes. We're going to start out by talking very briefly about prokaryotic cell division. Your textbook goes into a lot of signaling molecules and proteins that you don't need to know. We're just going to look at take home messages. Then we'll get into cell division and that section is really about kind of the basic uh, language that you need to understand cell division. So we'll kind of do an introduction to those terms, then go over the cell cycle, how the cell cycle is regulated, and then how that ties into cancer. So starting out with prokaryotic cell division, remember that prokaryotes um, are these kind of unicellular life forms, archaea and bacteria. Um, and usually when we talk about them, we're talking about bacteria. Uh, they do not have a nucleus. Their DNA is arranged into this area of their cell called the nucleoid, um, but they do not have that membrane-bound organelle. They don't have any membrane-bound organelles, let alone a nucleus. And again, when we're talking about prokaryotes, we're generally talking about bacteria, but archaea are structurally fairly similar, even though genetically they're quite distinct. So this is a GIF uh, of a sped up version of binary fission, even though bacteria reproduce very quickly within a matter of hours, it's certainly not this fast. Um, binary fission is just a simple term or a kind of fancy term to describe this process of division. 
Um, so the bacteria have one single chromosome, that's a, an orga organized structure of DNA, and it's a circle. And that circular chromosome gets copied while cell division is happening. Um, the cytoplasmic contents of the cell get split up, the cell elongates, and it divides. So it's a very simple process because you don't have to worry about all of these organelles. So here's a kind of a step-by-step -step process to help visualize that. Um, the origin of replication is just a spot on the chromosome that enzymes can kind of connect with and help copy that DNA. Um, so we see that circular chromosome being copied as the cell is stretching out. The septum is starting to divide it as those new chromosomes get to each opposite side of the cell. And then you have two new cells that are completely identical. And for unicellular organisms, this is really the only way to reproduce. They can't really mate with each other. Um, they just kind of divide. That being said, bacteria have a lot of cool things that they do. Uh, they have these things called plasmids, which are tiny circles of DNA that code for super powerful proteins, like um, proteins that help fight antibiotics. And the bacteria can kind of just like trade them like starter packs um, and so they uh, can confer superpowers that way they can pick them up from the environment they can share information uh, using these structures called pili so they do have ways of exchanging genetic information but usually the only way to make more copies of themselves is through binary fission so when we're thinking about how this is relevant for us as humans, and when we're studying eukaryotes, um, we have to keep in mind that our DNA also needs to be copied before our cells can divide. And also the cell has to elongate and divide in a process that's separate from the process of DNA separation. So the DNA is separating and the cell itself is also separating. And those are fundamentally two separate processes. Okay, so getting into section 10.1 on cell division, and like I mentioned, that's really about DNA terminology. Um, remember that eukaryotes do have a true nucleus. They have a membrane-bound organelle that houses their DNA. So when we're talking about DNA, thinking way back to the very beginning of the class when we talked about chemical levels of organization, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acids. These are um, a type of macromolecule that provides the genetic code. So there's really a blueprint for making proteins. Um, three nucleotides code for one amino acid, and those amino acids build up proteins. Um, that relationship between DNA, messenger RNA, and proteins is called central dogma or transcription and translation. We'll cover it in a little bit more depth next week. Um, I wanted to point out the people on the right side of the image. Um, the top people are uh, uh, Watson and Crick, um, so James Watson and Francis Crick. Um, the man below them is Maurice Wilkins, and the wonderful woman on the right is Rosalind Franklin. You also might have heard of her recently, um, or maybe not, a lot of people haven't. Um, Watson and Crick are generally associated with discovering the structure of DNA. But the only reason they were able to accomplish that was because they had someone steal an image from Rosalind Franklin. So Rosalind Franklin uh, was an x-ray crystallographer. She took pictures using this special technique um, of the structure of different molecules, and she was able to photograph DNA. So this was before we knew it was a double helix, um, and her image actually is what allowed these researchers to figure out that that was the structure of DNA. No one knew that beforehand, um, but it was taken again without her consent, um, and she ended up dying of cancer as a result of her techniques, which were instrumental for figuring out DNA. Um, because you can't get the Nobel Prize after you die, it's not awarded posthumously, she did not get any recognition for her achievements, and the other three got the Nobel Prize. Um, so pretty shady business, but unfortunately something that continues to happen in academia. Um, women who are researchers have to publish way more in much higher journals um, to get as much respect and acknowledgement as their male peers. Um, it happens at 
conferences. It happens in the research setting. Um, there's actually a movement right now called Me Too STEM where people are coming out about kind of um, sexual harassment and also other issues that are systemic um, against women and non-binary folks in uh, science, technology, engineering, and math research. Um, so uh, scientists are definitely not just like super calm, rational people. They are deeply flawed humans, just like everyone else. Um, and the systemic issues that are at play in the rest of our society are certainly at play within academia as well. Um, okay, so after another tangent, uh, getting into the structures of DNA and how we package it. Um, so think about the inside of your nucleus, kind of like a room full of yarn. And if you wanted to make a copy of that yarn and move it around, it would be impossible to do that if the yarn was all soupy and all over the place. But with yarn, we organize it into spools, and that's basically what we do with our DNA. We wrap it around these special proteins called histones that packs it together into this organized structure called a chromosome. So when DNA is kind of floating around in soupy, we can actually do stuff with it, we can code for proteins, but when it's packed into chromosomes, we can really easily move it around and make sure it gets divided between different cells. So chromosomes are organized structure of structures of DNA and proteins. So remember the DNA codes for the histone proteins and then it physically wraps around them. Um, so kind of trippy, but that's what helps it get packed down into those organized structures. Um, so you're able to pack massive amounts of DNA into really tiny cells unless they're being actively used. Um, and I wish we could do the strawberry DNA extraction in lab, but um, there's kind of this protocol where you extract all the DNA out of a strawberry and it's just like a ton of material so you can see how much DNA we have packed into our cells. Um, but I'll try to find a video of it on YouTube and link it uh, on Canvas so you have an idea of what that looks like. Last week we also talked about homologous chromosomes. Um, so the top right image is a karyotype um, and so that's just a photo of the chromosomes lined up to quickly identify any chromosomal abnormalities. And in this case, this is an image of trisomy 21, where this individual has three copies of chromosome 21. Um, this is called Down syndrome, so it's a very common trisomy, but there's a lot of trisomies that result in um, really, really debilitating conditions that are not survivable. So Down syndrome is absolutely survivable. Um, there are a lot of health risks associated with it, uh, but it's something that we are familiar with and that is common because it is so survivable. Um, so when we're talking about these chromosome pairs, those are homologous chromosomes. So in this case, there's three homologous chromosomes at chromosome 21. All these other chromosome pairs are homologous chromosomes that have the same size, the same shape, and the same genes, but they're not completely identical. So they have different forms of the genes. Um, so just to kind of explain that a little bit, let's look at chromosome seven, uh, and let's pretend that the black band on that codes for hair color. So uh, my dad's family is Indian, um, they're, they're Goan, and my mom's family is white. Um, so if those chromosomes were from my parents, um, it could be that the chromosome on the left is from my mom and that gene, or yeah, that particular copy of the gene codes for uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, because my mom has blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, maybe the chromosome on the right is from my dad and the genes there code for black hair and brown eyes. Um, so next week we'll talk more about the interaction between those genes and how it comes to play that I really just look Indian and you can't really tell that I'm also half white. Um, but that's kind of what I'm getting at there is that those genes or those chromosomes have the same genes but just different versions. So um, they both code for hair, they both code for eyes, but one is brown hair, one is blonde hair. Um, so that's what uh, we're talking about when we talk about alleles, different forms of genes. So one set of your chromosomes is from one parent, the other set is from the other parent, and that's how we get matching pairs, these homologous chromosomes.
And again, chromosomes have 23, or humans have 23 different chromosomes um, to each in most of their cells, except for gametes like sperm and eggs, where we only have one of each, so 23 total chromosomes. The homologous chromosomes get split up in meiosis. Um, so if uh, the reason there's that 23andMe in the top left is if you've ever heard of that company, 23andMe, that sequences your DNA, the reason it's called 23andMe is because you have 23 different chromosomes. Okay, so when we're looking at the overall structure of a chromosome, you might have heard of telomeres before. Um, those are talked about often in the context of aging because there's some evidence that uh, the length and integrity of the telomeres is associated with why we age. Um, but think about telo like a telescope. It's far out there. And mirror indicates the position on the chromosome. So telomeres are on the outside, the far edges of the chromosome centromeres are on the center of the chromosome. So centromeres are the region of DNA found near the middle of the chromosome where two identical sister chromatids come into contact. Um, so you're gonna see terms like if you uh, look this up online where you might see kinetochore. Um, kinetochore is just like a special protein that's stuck on the centromere. So we're gonna use those interchangeably. It's also where the spindle fibers attach. Um, so you might, again, see the term like microtubule or spindle fiber or spindle. Those are all kind of getting at the same thing. They're these structures that kind of shoot out from organized things called centrioles and attach to these big pieces of DNA and pull them apart. And that happens at the centromere. So I use that term sister chromatid and I wanna explain what that means. Um, so on the left side, you see that big pink chromosome and it looks kind of similar to the chromosomes that we saw in the karyotype. Um, and actually I'm gonna kind of draw on this really fast so that it looks a little bit more like those. So right now that's one chromosome made of one big DNA molecule called a chromatid. But after synthesis, a particular part of this cell cycle, now you have two completely identical sister chromatids. So these are exactly the same. They have the exact same sequences of DNA. Um, so if this were my example, then maybe those two sister chromatids that are attached to each other both code for black hair and brown eyes. And then the other set, um, there would be another big X over here, code for blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, so each of these is a single chromosome. Um, it's just whether it's made of one chromatid or two chromatids, one big piece of DNA or two big pieces of DNA. And at different parts of the cell cycle, they look like one or the other. So DNA replication increases the amount of DNA or chromatids, but it does not increase the number of chromosomes. So the amount of DNA is increased, but not the number of chromosomes. That's really trippy and hard to understand. Just sit with it and grapple with it for a while. So those sister chromatids are copies of chromosomes that are made during the S phase or synthesis phase of the cell cycle. We'll get into that in just a moment. And they are theoretically made of the exact same sequence of DNA unless there's a typo or a problem with the DNA replication process. So again, here we have those homologous chromosomes on the left. Um, one of them is green, maybe that's from mom. The purple one is maybe from dad. After replication, you now have two green guys, those are sister chromatids, they are exactly the same. And then on the right, you have two purple guys, those are also sister chromatids, they're sisters to each other. And those two X's are homologous chromosomes to one another. Um, so this guy over here is not identical to this guy over here or to this guy over here. Um, so just keep that in mind. They're only sisters to, and identical to the chromatids that they're attached to. So like I mentioned, there's a lot of synonymous terms. Um, when you see kinetochore, just kind of keep in mind that that means the same thing as centromere. When you see microtubules or spindle fibers or kinetochore microtubules, keep in mind those all mean basically the same thing. 
And I say that because uh, in a lot of biology resources, they make it way more complicated than it needs to be. This is not a cell bio course. We're not really distinguishing between these different things. Okay, so to kind of talk broadly about the cell cycle, um, each cell that does go through division goes through this whole life process. Um, so it starts out with G1 or growth one or gap one, it's called a lot of different things. Um, and so during this period, that's when the cell um, basically uh, is just like kind of growing, the DNA is not being copied, it's just doing kind of cell stuff, it's building up ATP, it's making proteins, it's just doing its thing. In synthesis, that's when the chromosomes duplicate. And then in G2, that's when your cell double checks to make sure that that duplication happened correctly. So I like this image because you can see that the chromosomes look differently after synthesis, even though you're not increasing the number of chromosomes, you're still increasing the amount of DNA. So this whole part, uh, G1, S, and G2, are part of what's called interphase, which is basically every part of the cell cycle other than mitosis and cytokinesis, which we'll get to in just a moment. Also keep in mind that the cell doesn't necessarily have to go through this whole process of division. Sometimes it just goes into G0, which is a rest, where it's not moving forward with the cell cycle, but it's also not dying. So in interphase, when you're looking at cells under the microscope, uh, the DNA is kind of just floating around the, um, the nucleus. Um, so here we see these are plant cells, so we can see the box of them, the cell walls, and then this is the nucleus. And so we can see all the DNA floating around that nucleus. Um, and so it's not packed into organized structures of chromosomes. So when you look at a slide under the microscope, most of the cells are in interphase because it's about 90% of the cell cycle and it's not part of mitosis. Uh, a lot of the stages of mitosis end in phase, which is kind of confusing. Interphase is not part of that. It's everything other than mitosis. Um, but it's where the cell is growing and copying its chromosomes. So we have G1, S, and G2. So that's gap or growth one, synthesis and gapper growth two. So again, uh, within interphase, we have first gap where the cell is very biochemically active. It's producing proteins and cellular energy, ATP, um, and other kind of forms of stored energy. We have synthesis where the DNA is condensing and each chromatid is copied. And then we have second gap where um, you're rebuilding up those proteins and energy reserves, which were kind of used up during synthesis, which is very energy intensive. Um, and then uh, the cell is also proofreading to make sure that that synthesis happened appropriately. So again, I really want to reiterate this, synthesis increases the amount of DNA, but not the number of chromosomes. So at no point do you have 92 chromosomes. You have 92 chromatids, but not 92 chromosomes. So at the start of the cell cycle, there's 23 pairs of chromosomes and each pair kind of looks like this little thing on the right, bottom right, uh, with these little purple lines. And then after synthesis, at the end of the cell cycle, there's 23 pairs of chromosomes and each pair looks like this. They look like that X with a centromere in the middle because they're made up of two sister chromatids held together at the centromere. So I'm gonna go through this. Um, so I, we missed it last time. So the spermatozoa is going through that zone of follicula. Um, you have the sperm and the egg uh, merging together so that you're, they're fusing. Then you have mitosis, you have two different cells, and then you have mitosis again and four different cells. I missed that at the last lecture and this gift does not repeat very quickly. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you caught that. Um, but Remember, this process of mitosis is super important from going from one cell to many cells, and it involves the division of the DNA as well as division of the cell itself. So mitosis is also called karyokinesis. Um, that karyo, again, has to do with the nucleus. So think about like prokaryote, eukaryote. Prokaryote means before nucleus, so prokaryote. 
um, karyotype is the type of DNA that we have. It's our chromosomes. So karyokinesis is the movement of the nucleus. It's the movement of the DNA. Um, so mitosis is referring to that process of DNA division. Cytokinesis is referring to the movement or division of the cell. So we have both of those processes happening. We have karyokinesis, mitosis, and we also have cytokinesis, cell movement. Cyto means cell. So I know that I repeat terms a lot, but I really want you to be familiar with that language and be able to apply it in other settings. Okay, so getting specifically into mitosis uh, and cytokinesis, so continuing section 10.2. Um, so the way that we get more cells is through different types of cell division, mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is asexual, where you're producing two identical cells. Meiosis is the basis of sexual reproduction, where you're producing four haploid gametes that only have one set of DNA in each of them, and they are all different from one another. We'll expand on that a lot more next week, but for now, just focus on mitosis and producing identical cells. Mitosis is divided into different phases, so I'm going to walk you through each phase. Uh, keep the term PMAT in mind, and we'll get back to it in just a moment. Um, so before we walk through the different phases, I just wanted to remind you mitosis and meiosis are happening at very different points. Mitosis is how we go from a zygote to a complex adult organism. It happens throughout our adulthood, too, in different types of cells. Um, and then meiosis is the formation of gametes, full stop. It's just making sperm and making eggs. It's not actually getting into fertilization and reproduction. It's just how we get sperm and eggs. Okay, so getting into the phases of mitosis, we're going to start with prophase, which is pictured on the right, where DNA condenses into chromosomes. So the DNA is just condensing into chromosomes. Um, the nucleus is also breaking down because the DNA has to be able to move around. In metaphase, M for middle, the DNA lines up in the middle of the cell. So at this point, you have one sister chromatid from each chromosome on either side of an imaginary line called the metaphase plate. Um, so you can see that really clearly in that central image. Um, it's that line down the middle, and then you have the sister chromatid sticking off the sides. But everything's still kind of attached, which is important to note because the next phase is anaphase for moving away. Um, and here you can quite clearly see that there's a separation between the sister chromatids. So they're moving away and the cell is also elongating. So remember, until this point, we've been looking kind of at the DNA. We also have to keep in mind that the cell is going to divide, so it's going to stretch out. The spindles are coming off of organized structures in the animal cell called centrioles, which are on either side of the cell. There's kind of like the puppeteer um, moving the marionette strings. Um, those are the centrioles. So those uh, centrioles are shooting out these spindle fibers that are attached to those sister chromatids and now in anaphase pulling them apart to each side of the cell. So anaphase away. And then in telophase and cytokinesis, which basically happen simultaneously, the daughter cell pulls apart the cell membrane and wall form again, as well as the nucleus. And now you have two separate identical cells. It's still kind of easy to see them on a microscope slide though, because they're really tiny. They haven't grown into fully adult cells yet, and they're still kind of attached to each other. So this is kind of a summary of all of them from your textbook uh, with a little bit more details, including stuff about the nuclear envelope and the nucleolus. Um, I also want to point out that here they distinguish between prophase, prometaphase, and metaphase. Um, so prometaphase is another additional phase that sometimes people uh, use to kind of distinguish between certain events at the end of prophase and the beginning of metaphase. And we also see that on this stained fluorescent image here where the microtubules, the proteins are green and the DNA is red. Um, so you can see there's some differences between prophase, prometaphase, and metaphase, but all of these are really just human constructs. So it's kind of how we sort things and organize them in our head. Um, it's not anything where like 
your cell is dividing and it's like, okay, now I am in pro meta phase. It's something that just makes sense to us and how we organize it. And just to reiterate that, um, here is a GIF visualizing mitosis. Um, I love watching this. It's kind of like the uh, centrioles and spindle fibers are the monsters that squish the DNA together and then rip it apart, which is basically what's happening. But here you can see that even though this is sped up, it's a very fluid process. So uh, it's not like, okay, now I'm in prophase, now I'm in metaphase. You can kind of see it, but it's very, very fluid. I really love this gift. <laughs> okay, so when we're thinking about animal cells and plant cells, there are structural differences. And the key structural difference is that plant cells have a cell wall. So the way that they divide in cytokinesis is different between animal cells and plant cells. Animal cells do not have a cell wall, so their plasma membrane is what's the focus. It's what's contracting and separating. So there's something that we called a contractile ring that's made up of protein that wraps around that plasma membrane and forms a cleavage furrow that separates out the two cells. We study mitosis in animals often using something called whitefish blastula. Remember that blastulas we learned about last week are an early stage of development and it's where there's a ton of mitosis taking place. So uh, we've gotten past kind of the zygote stage, there's really active division. That's why blastulas are great for observing mitosis. Um, so here's some kind of clear images of that. We see prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So uh, on a quiz or an exam, just when you get to the part about mitosis, write down PMAT so you can keep track of the order of them. It's just kind of a simple mnemonic device to remember the order of the phases of mitosis. These images are super clear, but the trouble is that, remember, a blastula is a bunch of cells packed together, and a blastula is also shaped like a circle, which can be really confusing because if you don't have any idea about the size and scale, you might look at that one circle that's the blastula and think that's a single cell. Um, so that's a totally normal mistake to make, but when you look at these in the lab, just make sure you kind of uh, focus on one particular cell at a time, which will really look more like this. Um, so here, this is one cell. This is the DNA, and these are the sister chromatids along the metaphase plate. Um, so that's a single cell. This is a single cell undergoing prophase. This is a single cell undergoing anaphase. So they're all packed together in this blastula. For plant cells, plant cells have a cell wall, and so they have to reform that cell wall when they divide, and they do that using a structure called a cell plate, which is basically a baby cell wall. So a key distinction between animal cells and plant cells is the uh, cleavage furrow and contractile ring for animal cells and the cell plate for plant cells. And recognizing that is definitely something that will help you on the quiz and the exam. So we observe this uh, in plants using root tips. Um, and the reason for that is that when you plant a seed, uh, the new cells of the root kind of extend downward. Um, they divide, the, the seed itself stays put, and the new cells uh, are formed at the tip of the root. Root tips also have this kind of like cap on them to protect them from the soil, um, but inside of that cap is where you have the cluster of the most mitosis. So root tips, especially onion root tips, are really helpful for observing mitosis. So when you look at them in lab, you'll be able to see um, a ton of them again packed together, but even here we can really clearly see metaphase. Um, so there's a lot of metaphase. Um, those are kind of the easiest ones to pick out in this image, um, but each one of these boxes represents a cell, um, and then the circles inside are the nuclei, um, or where the DNA is located. Uh, kind of zoomed in and labeled on the right, you can see some of those individual faces. <laughs> 
All right, so when we're thinking about how this process is regulated, um, there's kind of different points in time in which the cell's machinery stops to make sure things are going correctly, and we call these checkpoints. And so these are particular phases in the cell cycle where the cell basically evaluates its life and it's like, uh, is stuff happening the way it should? Um, and so if it's not, the cell cycle stops. It doesn't continue with that problem in place. So there's very particular checkpoints that I wanted to emphasize. There's G1, which happens in G1. Um, and so this is when the cell determines whether it will divide at all. And if not, it just kind of goes into G0 or hangs out in G1. Um, so here it's checking for cell size. Is it big enough? Does it have enough nutrients to copy its DNA? Because that's an intensive process. Does it have the right growth factors? Does it have any DNA damage that it wouldn't want to pass on? Um, so growth one is that first checkpoint. There's also growth two, which is after synthesis. So it's gone through this whole transformative process where it's made a whole other set of DNA, and now it has to spell check it. So it's like, is there any DNA damage? It Was replication carried out completely, or is there anything missing? And then if it passes that point, it can start to divide. But even that process requires oversight. So there's the spindle checkpoint, which happens during mitosis. So this makes sure that the chromatids are attached to the spindle at the metaphase plate correctly and that they are assorted on either side of the metaphase plate correctly. There's also some external cues um, to kind of start the process or stop the process of cell division. Uh, some of those can be things like hormones. So for example, human growth hormone um, is really important for cell division in skeletal muscle, cartilage, and other things. Um, it goes through a similar process to the hormonal indicators that, or uh, kind of signal pathways that we've talked about before. Um, so it's released from the brain, it goes to different parts of the body, it has this series of steps, um, and it causes the growth of skeletal muscle, cartilage, and other types of tissue by cueing cell division to happen. If you have a kind of normal amount of growth hormone, then you end up being a certain size, but having too little growth hormone is associated with certain types of dwarfism, and having too much growth hormone is associated with gigantism. There's a lot of other hormonal cues that indicate the cell should or should not go through cell division, whether it has enough resources, if it's overcrowded, um, the cell size, because remember there's that surface area to volume limit, those all affect cell division. Um, and then the signaling proceeds, just like how we've talked about before, there's the signal, it binds to a receptor, uh, there's a series of intracellular processes, and there's an effect. And that effect might be divide or don't divide. There's also these things called regulator molecules that are produced inside the cell and can either act individually or work with other regulatory proteins. And we divide them into two different classes, those that move the cell cycle forward and those that stop it. So positive regulators are things like cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. These keep the cell cycle moving forward. They move towards division. Negative regulators are things like retinoblastoma proteins, P53, which is super important, and P21, and those act to stop the cycle or act maybe temporarily or stop it completely. So when we're thinking about the cell cycle stopping completely, we're talking about a process called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So in the image on the right, if a cell is injured and dies, that process is called necrosis. But if there's some damage to the cell that's not going to kill the cell, but is going to be very bad for the organism, then the cell gets a cue to enter apoptosis. So it gets uh, cued to go through programmed cell death. So again, it's different from necrosis, which is death due to an external factor. This is the cell signaling to itself, hey, something's wrong. If you keep dividing and making copies, this is going to stick around and get passed on. Um, so P53 is part of kind of these signaling pathways that recognize and repair DNA damage. It kind of flags things down. It's like, hey, come fix this problem. If the problem can't be fixed, then P53 indicates to the cell, cell hey, you know, we have to go through program cell death. You can't make copies of yourself because we can't fix this problem.
So apoptosis is really important because it stops us from developing cancer. Um, so we actually have tons of repair mechanisms that are working all the time. So for example, when you walk from your car to the lab room, you're exposed to UV light. That UV light goes through your skin and hits your DNA and actually causes your DNA to develop bumps called thymine dimers. Those thymine dimers make it impossible to code for proteins or to make copies of your DNA. So you have this whole amazing intricate pathway where your cell recognizes that damage, cuts it out, fixes it, just that tiny little section and smooths the whole thing over. And that's happening constantly as you're walking around, like especially in Fresno, Clovis and Madeira, right? Where it's super sunny a lot of the time. Um, and so when everything's working smoothly, then we can just fix that damage. But sometimes there's oversight, it doesn't get fixed, or sometimes we're missing parts of that nucleotide excision repair pathway. Um, and so if the cell were to keep dividing, that could lead to cancer, could lead to these accumulated mutations and cancer. So the cell also has the ability to just stop that division process completely. So if DNA damage can't be fixed, it can lead to cancer, and removing the damaged cell completely removes the risk of cancer. So kind of transitioning along those lines and getting into how cancer relates to the cell cycle, um, there's a lot of problems associated with P53, uh, specifically P53 not working. So P53 is a protein, it's coded for by DNA, and if that DNA is damaged, then you have mutated P53 and you have a P53 protein that's not able to stop the cell cycle. Um, and so in a normal situation, if you have DNA damage, if you have cell cycle problems or low oxygen conditions, P53 kind of slows down the cell cycle enough to fix the problem or it causes apoptosis. If P53 is mutated and not working, then the cell cycle just continues and the cells can become cancerous. You might have heard of the technology known as CRISPR. Um, this is like an interesting new way of going through gene editing uh, and fixing a lot of really serious health risks, um, but we still don't know a lot about it. And also it turns out that CRISPR works best if you have mutated P53, uh, which is a problem because then it's highly associated with cancer. So you're fixing some problems, but you're predisposing yourself to, to, uh, to cancer. So P53 is what's called a tumor suppressor protein, which is coded for by tumor suppressor genes. So these tumor suppressor genes are those negative regulators. They basically put the brakes on uncontrolled cell division. And mutated P53 genes have been identified in more than 50% of all human tumor cells. So it's pretty clear that there's a correlation here between having a problem with your P53 and developing cancer. Remember, we also talked about positive cell regulators, which are coded for by proto-oncogenes. And so these accelerate cell division, but if there's a mutation with them, if there's a problem, then you're accelerating cell division in ways that are not healthy. So basically, cancer is this combination of cutting the brakes um, and putting a brick on the accelerator. So you're cutting the brakes, you're shutting down those tumor suppressor genes and you're basically putting a break a brick on the accelerator and just continuing to have those proto oncogenes or those oncogenes uh, have unregulated cell division so you're not able to stop the cell division and in fact it's going forward at an unhealthy rate so I also wanted to take a moment to share this link um, and to talk briefly about uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, because um, that's what October is. Uh, but it's also really challenging because um, for some reason, uh, we have kind of over-sexualized breast cancer. And I remember when I was young, everyone wore those um, save the tatas or save the boobies bracelets. And it's just, really reductive and really sexualizing an issue that is not sexy. When you are going through breast cancer or someone you love is going through breast cancer, it is an overwhelming and awful process in so many ways. And 
we should be thinking about saving humans, not saving particular structures on them that we think of as being attractive. And it also puts this enormous amount of pressure on people who might have to have their breast tissue removed in order to feel, you know, uh, approved of by society or accepted. Um, and so, you know, you don't necessarily want to engage in sexual activities when you're experiencing cancer. You don't necessarily want to go through reconstructive surgery after you've had a mastectomy and had your breast tissue removed. Um, it's just a very complicated process. And I think when we talk about it, we should make an effort to humanize people who are going through cancer, not deify them and not reduce them to their sexual organs. Um, so I just want to take a moment to point out that there's a lot of resources available, uh, even just emotional support. If you're a caretaker, uh, you deserve that. You can't pour from an, from an empty cup. So you deserve to have someone lifting you up also to help you continue to help other people. Um, so there's resources available to you. Uh, and I just wanted to share those. Okay, so uh, make sure that you read the quiz feedback. Um, the quiz will be posted at a normal time this week. I'm sorry for the delay last time. Uh, hopefully you listen to this lecture. Uh, check the study guide, which will also be pro uh, posted at an appropriate time. Um, email me if you have any questions. Complete the online, online reflection, which is already posted. Um, and that's it.